In 2016, I had the pleasure to be working with 100, a Finnish initiative designed to seek and share inspiring innovations in K-12 education. My first assignment with them was to identify 100 education thought leaders and interview them about their thoughts on the future of education. Kind of a dream job, really. And in amongst the amazing people I was lucky enough to interview, I got to interview Dad. It was the only time I ever did interview him, and it is one of my most cherished memories. Following on from the chat Daryl and I had, we thought we'd share this clip from the 100 interview with Dad, talking about his favourite school memories. The role of education is to help the students to learn. And the people who do that are not the policy makers or the superintendents, it's the teachers who do that. So the heart of education is the relationship between teachers and learners. That's what it's about. And everything else should be focused on making that the best relationship possible. And the problem is that over time, all kinds of things have got in the way of it. Trying to improve education, trying to transform it, trying to get good work in great schools isn't some unfathomable mystery like curing certain diseases seems to be. We kind of know what works. I mean, there are great places all around the world already doing it. Uh, the problem lies in the insistence of some policymakers, I think, uh, that everything has to be done in the same way, that they, they are promoting a kind of homogeneity and really interesting learning environments are not homogeneous, they're diverse and they, they adapt and they change and they are suited to different sorts of purposes. There's freedom to move, there's freedom to use different sorts of materials, freedom to collaborate and to interact with other people um, and to work on projects as well as to work quietly on, on theoretical tasks. So uh, the best learning environments are the ones that do that, they embody the variety of learning. We asked one of the teachers if he would direct it and he agreed to do that. And uh, it went very well. And the following year we did another one. It came up a third time and we said to him, would you direct it? And he said, you know, I can't, I haven't got time to do it. And then he said, so, you know, I, I did say I couldn't direct the play this year, but I do have a suggestion, I think Ken should direct it. Well, I nearly passed out because it had never crossed my mind that I could direct a play or that anyone in the group would agree to it. I just didn't feel I had that relationship with them. I thought, you know, the director is somebody who has to preside over this whole thing. But they all just looked around and said, great idea, great. And I was terrified. But, you know, I learned a long time ago that you shouldn't walk away from things that trouble you. you know, the best way to deal with the fear is to go straight towards it and try and get hold of it. Partly because of that experience and probably doing what I do now can be traced back to some extent to that little divergent point. And if he'd, not said, will you direct the play? I'd probably be running a bar somewhere now in Warrington. <laughs> if you recognize that it is a human system that's dynamic and is changing, it makes the, the task more plausible. So I always say to teachers, uh, if they ask me, they say, how can I change the system? Well, the first thing is to recognize that you are the system that everyone in the system is a manifestation of the system. So if you change what you do, you are changing the system. And the interesting thing about this to me is that there is much more room for innovation in the system as it is than very many people seem to realize. Hello everyone and thank you so much for giving me a chance to say a few words in this remarkable event. My name is Saku Tuominen and I'm the co-founder of a global education nonprofit called 100. Our mission is to identify impactful and scalable education innovations and then help them spread. 
and we have been analyzing innovations from all continents and we have network in over 100 countries. And I'm not saying this uh, to underline how remarkable we are, but I'm saying it for a really specific reason. And I would say that we would not be here without Sir Ken Robinson. Because in the early days when we studied, I'd say that he was the first really big name who was backing us. He believed in us before no one else besides us did. Uh, he was creating connections, he did introductions, he tweeted about us. And we are eternally grateful for that help. And that's why we decided to devote our creativity spotlight last year for him. But I'd say that this is kind of like just the tip of the iceberg, obviously. obviously. We have the speeches, we have the quotes, we have the thoughts, we have the books and so on. But I'd love to see his legacy to live beyond that one. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of room for improvement in education and the change is happening in each and every country at the moment. But there's an alarming development happening in, in many locations which is that there's so much resistance that the people who are the most passionate ones, the forerunners, they are the ones who are getting burned out and they are leaving the industry. And if this continues to happen, the change will never ever happen. And I would love to see Sir Ken Robinson as a patron saint of everyone who are working in the front line to make the change happen. Uh, out of his quotes, probably my favorite is the one where he said, is that for many of us, uh, the problem is not that we try to aim too high and fail. It's the opposite. We aim too low and succeed. And, and I'm more than happy to promise that with 100, this won't be the problem. We might occasionally fail, but we will be aiming as high as possible in order to keep his thoughts, his visions, his dreams alive. And I'm happy to say is that each and every one in 100 knows the meaning Sir Ken had for our organization. And I miss him dearly. And I know that I always will. Thank you for helping us, Ken. We love you. Thank you, Saka. It was an honour to be invited to lead this fireside chat in memory of Sir Ken Robinson. Um, we are all linked to the organisation called 100.org. And um, in 2020, 100 did a spotlight uh, funded by Lego in memory of, of Sir Ken Robinson. And I'm delighted to have two of the finalists of, of the, the people um, chosen for that spotlight with me. That's Jigsasa Labru from Slam Out Loud in India and Pete Grimabrez from My Machine in Belgium. Welcome both. Jigasa, tell us about um, your work and why you started it. Absolutely. Um, so at Slam Out Loud, we believe that something as fundamental as finding our voice, having safe spaces for creative expression should not be limited to a privileged class. And hence what we do is we use art forms like theater, storytelling, spoken word poetry and visual art to build creativity and confidence in children, especially those who come from low income communities, for them to be able to find their voice really and um, get agency into their lives through that. Uh, one of the reasons why I really, really did it was because once I was in a classroom and I asked children to write a small poem about their emotions. And in that particular classroom, uh, which was in a conflict area in India, uh, children wrote about anger, sadness, hate. And I felt that such safe spaces for children to really express should not be a good to have, but a must have. Amazing. There are so many strong links with, with all that we've heard um, Sir Ken Robinson say in his lifetime. Pete, tell us your story of, um, of, of your work and why you started it. Well, what we do with uh, My Machine is um, it's a three-step methodology. We ask children who are in primary class, if we could build a dream machine for you, 
what would that dream machine do? So anything goes as long as they really, really want it. In step number two, we bring in university students and together they translate the original idea into a concept, a design. And in step three, we work with technical secondary level students or vocational students and together they build a working prototype. So we go from idea to concept to working prototype in one school year, one academic year, and we do it with lots of schools at the same time. And so the reason we're doing it is because we want to, you, you know, we, let, me, let me just share maybe some of the ideas. You know, children come up with brilliant dream machine ideas like the clean up my room machine or the uh, shake awake, which is a bed that shakes you awake instead of the dreadful noise of the alarm clock in the morning. Or it would be uh, uh, an anti-boredom machine or, or make my homework machine or even, you know, we've, we've learned that this is a world problem where you have a bunk bed and immediately when children see a bunk bed, they would, you would have a discussion who gets to sleep on top. So they invented a turning or rotating bunk, bunk bed. So you never have to discuss anymore who gets to sleep on top or below. Uh, but it's, it's about showing them the power of having ideas and why ideas matter and showing that, it, you, that you should not be afraid to share your idea, even though it might sound challenging or weird to somebody else's ear. Um, you know, never, 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 uh, doubt in, in, in the possibility of sharing your idea and because you can actually bring any idea to life and they learn that you can do that by collaborating, respecting each other's talents, being persistent and resilient. And so that is why we've created My Machine and we, we're operating in different countries around the world as we speak. Fantastic. There's a, there's a lovely quote from um, John Lennon about, you know, dreams are crazy until you share them. I, I love that, you know, given that it also comes from um, from Liverpool, where Sir Ken was from as well. Now, uh, both of you, I want to ask you the next question that many, many of us have, have our own Sir Ken stories, our encounters, our memories, our moments when when something he said really was uh, really spoke to us. And, and for many of us, it was life changing. Have you have you got a, a, a Sir Ken story you'd like to share? Pete? That is off. Well, you know, Alex, there's, I think there's many, I think many of us have many quotes and things that, um, that really inspired us, at least it, it certainly for me. Uh, maybe, she, maybe I was thinking of sharing that we had the opportunity to meet Sir Ken twice. The second time was in actually in Oklahoma. And that was a time when we asked um, if he would be willing to write the foreword uh, to, a, to a book that we were writing at the time. And he immediately said yes, and I was like so happy with it. And the next day, I, I you know, I met him again, and I said, Sir Ken, I, I didn't sleep at night uh, because I, I was actually surprised that you said yes to write our our forward. And then and then he said what something what I would say would typically be Sir Ken uh, that you know he said well he was smiling and say well I was surprised I said yes myself. Uh, but you know, now that I've said yes, let's let's do it. You know, let's let's have, let's write this book, and and I'll write you the foreword. And and I thought I was so typical of him, and making sure that I was feeling comfortable, that you know, being starstruck was you know it was swept away. And uh, I think for me that was typically uh, how I how I got to learn about Sir Ken. And the the power of saying yes as well. Yeah. Jigasa, what's your um, Sir Ken moment? Yeah, I think. Uh, of course, the first Ken moment I, uh, Sir Ken moment I ever had was uh, through his TED talk, watching that. Uh, when I just started, you know, I was right out of college and had just started uh, teaching a group of children in a low income community. And, um, and once, um, once I got introduced to him, I, I read this beautiful book called uh, Out of Our Minds. And um, I think my biggest Ken, Sir Ken Robinson moment was uh, once when I was really, really failing to achieve a goal. And um, I thought about how Sir Ken Robinson talks about um, the worrying part always being setting ourselves low goals and achieving them than setting up, uh, you know, really high goals or tough goals and failing. And, and that really spoke to me when I was failing um, because I did set myself up um, a really difficult goal and I failed. 
but the, the power of having audacious goals is this absolute dream is fantastic do you know something that, that 380 million people in 160 countries have watched that ted talk to school skill creativity so for both of you uh, your work seems to take up this idea of creative literacy a real science behind having a crazy idea and make it happen so, so it, almost as, it being as essential as the literacy of reading and writing. Why is that so important for you, this, this, this creative literacy? Jigyasa. Yeah, yeah. I think often we are always creating spaces for children where, where whatever they answer or whatever they think goes into the buckets of being right or wrong. And often that leads our children to set up smaller goals and smaller dreams for themselves. Uh, because they're wanting to fit in those buckets. But what will it take for our children to come up with things that are original, to come up with things um, that don't necessarily have to fit on those buckets? And what will it take to build that confidence or have that courage to share that with the world? And um, so Ken said that creativity is as important as literacy. Um, and I deeply believe that if our children are really to realize their innate potential, um, spaces for their creativity need to be created and fostered um, so they can find those original ideas because um, because we won't see the future our children will right and uh, in preparing them for something that we haven't seen uh, rather than telling them uh, about how to read and write which which is important uh, in its own way but uh, I think equally or more important is um, to have space for original ideas. Pete, creative literacy. Exactly, and um, I would say anybody who, who could relate to, to, to parenting and knowing, working with, uh, or being a parent of small children and helping them to grow up and discover their own talents and passions and you know make their own story, make their own life, create their own life and opportunities. I think we all know that, um, as a, for example, as a parent, if you're not prepared to listen to your children who are really young, for example, the four and five and six-year-olds, and if you're not prepared to, you know, to pay attention to them, to listen to on a daily basis, to listen to their stories, which obviously when they are four, five, six-year-old, they are small stories about what we as adults would probably think of like futile things, but for them, those those stories matter it's what you know it's their life and it's something that bothers them or makes them happy and they want to share their feelings with you and i think as a parent it is extremely important to listen to your children because if you do that it means that when your children will grow up they will also confide in you you know to come talk to you with the serious issues in life once uh, you know something would be around the corner for them um, and so it's building, it's building up that confidence to talk about, you know, and express your own feelings and everything. And I think the same goes for education. The same goes for people working in education, for people working in schools and trying to bring, you know, you know bring a context in which young people can discover their, their talents and it could be multiple talents and discover their passions, could be multiple passions. And, and I think this is extraordinarily important because when you value um, as an educator, when you also listen to your, you know, to the, to, to, to the students in your class, no matter the age, uh, you know, listen to them and listen to what, what is important, it will, they will take that with them as they grow up and as they might become, you know, great dancers or great, you know, poetry writers or great engineers or great uh, whatever it is that they want to pursue but they will they will have been in a, in a system where where people show that your ideas matter that your feelings matter and that you can actually you know do something with them and i think this is a it, that's why i think creativity is as important as literacy yeah. fantastic thank you both um now so ken said you know in, in terms of all of us you know young people themselves um, their, their parents educators are all working with certain kinds of jurisdictions with restrictions anywhere there are in the world and i think i love this phrase from from Sir Ken saying you know sometimes you can forget all that because you are the system when you're in front of that young person having a conversation with them you are the system so for for many people who perhaps don't have the same um uh, 
power, the, the same sort of self-belief that, that you both have in your work, what advice do you have for them if they feel restricted by the system they're working in? So let's go for you, Jigeta, first. Yeah, I think um, I completely believe and agree with what you quoted and Sir Ken Robinson is saying about like the system beginning from us. I think uh, individual changes lead to a lot of systemic changes uh, when done in unison or when done with keeping the bigger picture in mind. Um, and often uh, the most important step is the next step, uh, which is what can you do from today onwards or what you could do from tomorrow onwards um, to change something that, um, that you feel needs to change. Um, so, so that's that's one part of it, which is like really, really looking at what is in my locus of control, and then um, doing taking that one step to change that. Um, the second is um, collaboration. I think bringing voices together. There are always so many people who believe in similar things, and our world really, really needs all of them to come together and make their voices heard. I think Hundred has done a great job of bringing. Um, like-minded educators together and talk about creativity is as important as literacy. Like we've said the sentence so many times together and it has a very, very different force when people come together uh, to advocate for it. So like-minded people coming to advocate for something they deeply believe in is, is the second part. Thank you so much, wonderful. Pete, this idea of, of the system and how people can work with it or beyond it. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, great thoughts, uh, Jigyasa. I mean, uh, and indeed, hundred is is an is an incredible example of of like minded people that all want to somehow contribute to making education um, a bit a bit you know a, a bit of a better place as as um, as you know making it a little bit better uh, for the in the future, but um, and even today. But um, but yeah, I think um, for me, it's about you know I've, I've I see new types of schools popping up uh, in different countries. Um, I've been you know, fortunate to get to know some of them. And those are, I would say, always brilliant types of you know, schools doing things totally differently, which is brilliant. Um, yet, on the other hand, the reality is that the vast majority of children are still inside uh, schools which are indeed part of a system which is rigid, uh, which is, you know, everything Sir Ken talked about in his famous TED talk. So yes, the system is sometimes limiting stuff, but I would say to people working in education that there's this one thing that I never believe in, and it is a one, you know, one solution fits all. Uh, I don't think it exists. And so it means that as an educator, when you see uh, when you see some initiative out there, when you see another teacher doing you know doing the same kind of class that you're you're working in, but doing it a little bit differently, that might be inspiring to you. But it it doesn't mean that if it works for that teacher, that it would work for you, or it, it or even more that it doesn't mean that something you do this year with the with the students in your class this year that it will also work with the students next year in your class. So so be I would say, for me, that's comforting. It's comforting that, you know, as an educator, we, we, you know, we look for our own voice in how to be, how to do things differently within the system. And, and so I would say, look for the boundaries of, you know, what's possible inside, inside a system. Look for the boundaries and, and just look for something that makes you feel right, that you feel that is right, and that you see that it has impact on the students in your class. And for example, I, I think, one of the typical examples to me is what you know what we call project based learning as a great way of bringing in a project inside the rigid system and all of a sudden you see that you know that some things actually can can do work even though it's totally different than just being in front of the classroom um, so look for the boundaries and be confident and be confident that your own ideas as an educator also can work in your classroom and that's perfect Wonderful. Thank you both so much for those answers. Now, this event is called Imagine If, and I see it as a, as a sort of handing over of Sir Ken's legacy, you know, after his, his, his life has, has passed on. And it's sort of taking ideas 
um, and words into actions, which you both are doing so brilliantly. What's your imagine if, and how would you like it to come true in your lifetime? Jigasa. All right. Um, I sort of Big have question. an imagine. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I would divide the imagine if into two parts and um, only for uh, like ease of remembering. <laughs> the first is uh, imagine if um, children's spirit were part of their learning. And imagine if all children had safe spaces to find their own voice. And I hope to do both by bringing creative artistic opportunities uh, to children through our work. I really believe that uh, the arts are not the frills. Uh, the arts are really, really one place where we can find our own humanity, where we can really engage our spirits in our own learning. It's really funny that, you know, this idea of a child's spirit engaging in the learning process is such a radical one, while uh, we're all human beings and it should have been something that's a given, but it's not. And um, at the same time, how might uh, we create spaces where we get to listen to what is important to children, because they're not just our future, but also our today. And um, they're going to be leaders, not in the future, they should be leaders today, they should uh, be able to have a say in how they learn. Um, so that, yeah. Chika, so thank you so much. And there's such strong links between your work and Pete's. So Pete, over to you now, what's your imaginative? And how would you like it to come through true in your lifetime? I would say, you know, imagine if we would indeed, um, if we could create schools around the world where we would indeed listen to what the children are having as ideas and actually take them seriously. Um, and with that, for, for example, I mean that um, I've seen education systems where, um, for example, what Sir Ken was also trying to reach out to, for example, like somebody who's having a talent for dancing, for writing poetry, for, you know, being a visual artist. Uh, uh, and for others, it would be being an engineer or being, you know, you know a number crushing uh, or whatever. Um, but listen to what their ideas of what, what it is that they want to do and value that. I've seen, for example, in schools, for example, also in the country where, where I live in, where if you would have, um, as a child, being in school and, and wanting to do, um, um, you know, artistic, uh, some artistic ex expression, the typical answer would be that's that's something great to do in an out of school program. So, so the signal that we're giving is like those kind of things we don't really value. They're, they're not important. We don't value that. It's great do that on a Saturday, do it on a Sunday, you know. But but here in school we do we do the real stuff, and that is what I think we should leave behind. So th this this would be my sincere hope as my imaginative. Both fantastic answers. Um, in Sir Ken's words, to be creative, you have to actually do something. Uh, Jigasa in um, India with Slam Out Loud, thank you for all you're doing. Piet Grubin Prez with My Machine in Belgium, thank you for all you're doing. Um, I hope people have got many takeaways from today um, based on Sir Ken's words, based on your actions. Thank you, 100. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Saku. And of course, thank you, Sir Ken Robinson.